Yeah, thank you very much to you for this nice introduction. First of all, of course, I would like to thank the organizers of this lecture series on multilingualism for giving me the opportunity to present some results of the research that I have been conducting uh, during the last 10 years or so, I could say. And um, what I'm going to present today actually um, builds on data that we collected in several research projects uh, with several research partners. This is why you see such uh, a lot of icons there on the first uh, slide, because this research had been funded by various institutions and is also partly um, uh, joint work together with colleagues from Poland, first of all with Professor Aldona Sopata from the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan. So um, I'm going to talk about age effects in bilingual language acquisition uh, on the example of Polish-German bilinguals. And uh, here is the uh, roadmap that I want to pursue. Hope this works. Yeah, just the roadmap. I'm going to start with um, some very general remarks about age effects in language acquisition and attrition. And I'm afraid uh, this might be a bit too general for those of you who have already been uh, working on um, language acquisition. So for those of you who are experts in language acquisition, you can go and grab another drink and join this presentation in about 15 minutes or so when I'm going to present the data because this will be rather general, but as this is a lecture series that addresses a wider audience, I just uh, decided to include some of the basic facts that we know about age effects uh, in language acquisition and attrition uh, up to uh, the present point. I will then, uh, as a next step, shortly introduce Polish as a heritage language, uh, because it has been studied um, not so intensively, extensively uh, if compared to other heritage languages in Germany. Uh, then I will present the projects that my data come from and the participants that uh, took part in these projects. I will pose the research questions which I'm going to pursue in this talk. I will present to you two properties. The first of all will be from the domain of word order, uh, especially word order in complex word phrases in Polish. Then I will present some research on null subjects. And I will uh, end with some summaries of the main findings of, my, uh, of these uh, projects that uh, I'm talking about and also with some concluding remarks. So let's start. What do we know about age effects in language acquisition and attrition? Well, uh, I think uh, it's a very obvious thing to say that um, in um, language, um, monolingual language acquisition, that the age factor is, uh, is a well-known um, important thing that impacts on uh, language development. So if you compare uh, three-year-old children with five-year-old children with seven-year-old children, we would expect that we see a uh, progression with regard to their language skills. Uh, this is, of course, because they gain experience uh, with the language uh, uh, in, in due course during um, the time of their living, uh, So, which means that it's not always um, easy to separate the age effect from other things related to age, because it's not about the chronological age as such, because it's also about, of course, the exposure to the languages and of course the exposure increases with increasing age so um, you know sometimes could ask what is actually the effect of age and what's the effect of input uh, that is accumulated during the uh, living years of these uh, children and of course it's also related to the cognitive skills uh, of a human so of course with increasing age also the cognitive skills mature so this is why we expect in monolingual language acquisition that the longer the exposure, the longer the life is, the older the child is, the better he or she knows the language or speaks the language. If we look at age effects in bilingual language acquisition, of course, then uh, we get this problem, so to say, that the input uh, that the child receives is divided uh, up in, into two languages. So he, she or he or she receives input in two languages, at least, and as his or her day has also only 24 hours. This means that the um, relative amount of input uh, between the two languages um, might be not balanced. So there might be more input in one language and less input in another. And so this is why chronological age is very often considered as a, a proxy for the cumulative exposure to the two languages. Uh, so we can measure how much exposure the child received in one language and uh, in the other which might be, of course, differ for various 
phases of the lives. And um, if we look at especially the research that has been done on uh, the acquisition, um, on the effects of chronological, chronological age on heritage language acquisition, which will be my main focus, so we will be looking at uh, the L1 of our children who is, um, um, who differs from the majority language that the child grows up uh, in the society. So um, when we look at the previous research on the effect of chrono chronological, chronological age at um, heritage language acquisition, we find rather uh, inconclusive evidence. So there are studies uh, stressing that, uh, or there are studies uh, which found increasing uh, abilities in the heritage language with chronological age. Sometimes this is accounted for because there is an interaction between input measures and chronological age, but some of these studies also found an uh, impact of chronological age, even uh, irrespective of the amount of exposure uh, that, the child's, uh, that the children were exposed to. Other studies found no correlation of chronological age with the language skills in the heritage language. Um, um, Lyon et al. did this research on Portuguese in Germany and they investigated a, a wide range of um, uh, language skills and they, did found not, uh, did, didn't, they didn't found any correlation between the chronological age of the children they were looking at and their skills in heritage Portuguese. And if we look at the research on heritage languages in general, of course, you get the impression that for heritage speakers, it might be the reverse effect than for monolingual speakers of a language, because normally uh, in all the uh, definitions that were put forward to describe what a heritage speaker is, some component um, always relates to the fact that heritage speakers acquire a language within the family, which is different from the majority language. And at some point um, uh, of their uh, development, mostly when they enter the educational units, say when they enter the kindergarten, or uh, especially when they enter school, the language dominant uh, sort of shifts, the language dominant shifts, and the heritage language develops into the weaker language and might even undergo attrition and might even uh, result in only receptive knowledge of the heritage language in the long term. So uh, this would mean that we see rather um, an attrition effect with regard to the heritage L1, so this means the older the children are, the uh, worse uh, are their skills in the heritage language, so to say. So this is not quite clear where this goes to. If we look um, at um, age effects in bilingual language acquisition in general, um, this is a well-known fact that uh, it's not only about the chronological age of the children and the cumulative exposure, it is also related to the age of onset of the acquisition of the majority language, so the L2 age of onset. And um, I think most of you will know that there is a distinction between different types of bilingual language acquisition depending on the age of onset of the second language of the majority language. So normally we distinguish between simultaneous bilinguals who receive input in the two languages from birth, from early sequential or child bilingual uh, speakers who uh, sort of grow up first with only one language, the family language, the heritage language, but then um, mostly when, I said, uh, when, as I said, when the child enters the kindergarten or the school, then uh, systematic input uh, in the second language uh, starts and begins. And um, of course, if uh, the input starts at even a later age, we are already speaking about adult uh, second language acquisition, uh, AL2 uh, shortage, which means that uh, these kinds of types of bilingual language acquisition scenarios differ with regard to qualitative and quantitative outcomes of these uh, scenarios and with regard to the ultimate attainment in the languages that can be reached. And this is normally linked to biological facts or neurological facts. Um, you might all know the debate about the critical period, or the critical period hypothesis, or nowadays mostly called the multiple sensitive periods hypothesis, so that there are certain um, sort of um, uh, developmental spans where a child has to be exposed to a language in order to acquire it in a native-like way, um, um, which is uh, widely disputed. Um, but um, what is even more disputed, actually what is more highly controversial is when do we set, when do we set the uh, cutoff points between these three types of uh, bilingual language acquisition? Uh, so when does simultaneous bilingual language acquisition ends and when does early sequential bilingualism uh, starts and when does uh, adult, adult uh, L2 acquisition starts? 
And there are several cutoff points that were proposed in the literature. Um, so um, I'm just, uh, frankly speaking, uh, we decided in our projects to ad adopt the distinction that was made by Jürgen Meisel, uh, who uh, says that for him, there is a clear sort of bundle of sensitive periods uh, between the ages of three and four and six and seven, which means that um, the children who began to acquire both the languages before the age of three, so where the age of onset of the second language was before the age of three, we considered them simultaneous bilinguals, and um, those who were older than seven, we considered them already as early exponents of the adult L2 acquirers. So this is where we just stick to uh, what we found in, in, in Meisel's studies on age effects on these cutoff points between these different types of bilingual language acquisition. Um, yeah, if we look at, um, um, heritage uh, linguistics, especially uh, how is L2 age of onset treated uh, as a factor in studies on heritage language uh, uh, linguistics. So uh, normally it's considered, and as I said before, that um, the uh, age of onset of the second language marks the point where a switch in language dominance starts or begins to develop. So um, the L2 age of onset makes the start of this shifting of dominance uh, towards the majority language. And uh, this also means that um, um, a late um, age of onset of the second language sort of uh, reserves more time for the heritage language to develop independently from a second language. And this might lead to a greater entrenchment of this heritage language uh, before this competition with the L2 starts. This is what we find in the heritage language literature. And um, um, Studies that have uh, looked at this L2 age of onset effect uh, on heritage language um, proficiency or heritage language maintenance also uh, came to rather inconclusive results regarding the effect of this L2 age of onset factor. So some studies uh, found no correlation between the age of onset uh, of the second language and lexical and grammatical skills in the heritage language. I just cite two studies which are all dealing with Russian, and as I'm working on Slavic languages, of course, I know especially the literature on the Slavic uh, heritage languages. So Amon uh, and others in Gagarina uh, investigated Russian Hebrew and Russian German bilingual children, and they found no significant correlation between the effect of when the age of onset, uh, when, when the acquisition of the majority language starts and, um, and proficiency levels in the heritage language itself. But there are studies who find such significant correlations. Um, again, the study by Line et al. found significant correlations for receptive and productive lexicon and also productive morphosyntactic proficiency in uh, heritage Portuguese. And there are also other studies, for instance, by Janssen et al. who found that age uh, of onset of the majority language was even the only significant predictor of heritage language proficiency. Here in this uh, case, this was case marking in heritage Russian. Um, well, if we look at um, the age factor in studies on language attrition, uh, we also find um, several hypotheses that were put forward. First of all, uh, the well-known book by Silvina Montoul, um, uh, Age Effects in Language Attrition, where she states that language attrition, when it occurs in early bilingualism, so before the puberty, this means that uh, simultaneous bilingual heritage speakers who grew up with both languages from birth sort of have more problems in reaching uh, monolingual-like uh, proficiency if compared to early sequential bilinguals, which is, as I said, mostly accounted for by the divided amount of input that the simultaneous bilinguals receive from birth, which means that uh, lesser space is left for the heritage language to develop compared to the second language. But uh, Tanya Kupisch, my well-known colleague here from Constance, uh, has published a paper where she is sort of uh, raises doubts about this general assumption that Simultaneous bilinguals are uh, more at risk for not developing their heritage language in a sort of uh, native-like way. And she cites numerous studies on uh, bilingual language acquisition, bilingual first language acquisition, uh, and also uh, her own studies where she also has a lot of high proficient simultaneous bilingual heritage speakers. So this is again an unsolved question, I would say, in how far the acquisitional scenarios also impact on heritage language acquisition. If we look at studies on uh, first language attrition um, who take into account older speakers, there's also some age uh, boundaries mentioned. For instance, it's uh, generally um, an, an, an acknowledged fact that if um, the 
human individual um, sort of emigrates from his or her uh, native surrounding um, after the ages of 10 to 12, uh, then the grammatical properties will more or less remain intact. This uh, does not apply for lexicon, of course. So then, so after this point, it's more or less a lexical attrition that will occur, but not attrition of the grammatical factors. This is, was, was some age boundary that was um, um, sort of um, um, discussed in a lot of publications dealing with when uh, does uh, really grammatical uh, attrition sort of stops uh, at which age. So um, when uh, does the stabilization phase ends where uh, when after the stabilization phase uh, this grammatical uh, knowledge will remain more or less intact. So they reached the conclusion that this was between the ages of 10 to 12. So all children who left uh, after 10 to 12, there should be what with regard to the uh, grammatical properties uh, more or less um, comparable to monolingual speakers. Now, uh, turning to my own subject, which is uh, for this talk will be Polish, uh, mostly because I've been working on Polish as a heritage language in Germany for more than 10 years now. Um, and it's uh, interesting to see that although Polish is one of the most widespread heritage languages in Germany, that there's comparatively little, little research on Polish as a heritage language. So uh, according to official demographic surveys, we have about 2 million people who have a Polish migration background, which means that they uh, either migrated themselves from Poland to Germany or have at least one parent who did so. And uh, if we look closer at the statistics, there are approximately 436,000 um, people with a Polish migration background who were already born in Germany. So this is about 20%, which means that these are humans who sort of are potential heritage speakers of Polish in Germany. So we're talking about at least uh, approximately half a million because if we take into account that there are also people who might be, who might uh, be, uh, or who immigrated uh, to Germany at the ages say, between one to seven. So before entering the school system in Poland, so this sort of would also be considered heritage speakers of Polish. So we are definitely dealing with more than half a million speakers here in Germany. And what makes um, research on Polish as a heritage language rather interesting and also rather challenging is the fact that the Polish community is not very homogeneous. So there are several groups who can be distinguished. Uh, there are, first of all, there are the descendants of the so-called repatriates who returned to German as the homeland of their ancestors in several waves, which already started in the 1950s and 1970s, and then in the 1980s, and especially, of course, after the political turnover in Poland uh, in 1989. Uh, and there are also the descendants of so-called ethnic Poles. Um, so a lot of immigration is currently still going on from Poland to Germany. And um, this already peaked uh, when Poland joined the European Union in 2004. Um, and uh, nowadays, so the Polish immigration, or Poland is one of the most important uh, countries of origin for the current immigrants coming to Germany. And of course, we have to distinguish between heritage speakers living more in the western uh, part of Germany uh, and those who live in the immediate border regions to Poland, because this was a quite widespread phenomenon. And uh, when I was working in Greifswald, this was, uh, for me, quite a good thing to see that a lot of people moved from Poland to Germany and settled in the immediate border areas due to lower housing prices. And they, on a daily basis, then go to work uh, to Poland, but live in Germany and send their people, uh, send their children to German schools and kindergartens, which is why there is a rather high ratio of Polish speaking children in these schools and kindergartens in the immediate border area. But of course, they are sort of um, a rather special type of heritage speakers because they have close contacts to their friends and relatives on the Polish side and they uh, go there for even on a daily or weekly basis. So we cannot really compare them to uh, heritage speakers who grow up, say, for instance, in Frankfurt am Main or here in the Constance area, for instance. And there are, there's another divide between Polish heritage speakers who attend classes of Polish as a heritage or a foreign language and those who do not. And this also depends, of course, on the federal state that they are living in, because there are, of course, a lot of uh, some schools who offer Polish as a heritage to foreign language, mostly in the Eastern federal states who have a boundary to Poland but also in North Rhine-Westphalia, for instance, whereas in other countries, in other federal states, uh, there is uh, a rather limited amount of possibilities to um, attend the Polish heritage language instruction. So although there are a wide variety of institutions who offer these kinds of uh, language support for Polish heritage speakers, uh, 
I just want to point out the Catholic Church, so the uh, Polish Catholic Mission, who also organizes courses in religion, but also in Polish um, language, uh, Polish language courses for descendants of, um, of all children growing up in Polish speaking families here in Germany. So there are possibilities to attend these heritage language uh, courses, um, uh, which also makes uh, the uh, field for doing linguistic research and for gathering homogeneous samples rather challenging because you find sometimes uh, more people who attend these heritage language courses and in other cases you have more people who don't attend these ones so we had a lot of uh, a rather high share of people uh, who were attending these heritage language classes actually now uh, turning to the projects that the data that i will talk about come from uh, actually these will be three studies the first uh, study uh, is the one of the recent studies that uh, was a joint uh, project with my colleague Aluna Sabota from the University of Poznan. And our main focus there was uh, actually uh, the investigation of age of onset effects in Polish German uh, and Polish German uh, bilingual children. Uh, so we were focusing on an age span of children between the ages of five to 11. So most of our children were aged between eight and uh, 11 years old. And we investigated Polish as a heritage and German as a heritage language. Uh, why? Because we gathered data in both Poland and in Germany. So uh, we gathered data from Polish speaking children here in Germany, where Polish functions as the heritage language and German as the majority language, and compared these data also to um, uh, children growing up in German families in Poland, where German functions as the heritage language and Polish as the majority language. Uh, but I won't talk about this kind of comparison here in my talk. The second study uh, was also a joint uh, project together with a colleague from the University of Leipzig, where we had uh, run a longitudinal study on the development of Polish, but also Russian as heritage languages in teenagers. So there we investigated the age group um, sort of immediately following the first age group. So when we started this longitudinal project, most of our informants were around 12 years old. And when we finished it, uh, they were around 17, 18 years old. So this was a longitudinal study and the last study is the most remote study from a chronological point of view uh, was a cross-sectional stud study on young adult heritage speakers of Polish um, um, with an age span, age span starting from also 17, 18 but reaching uh, up to 36 and the mean age was about 22 so young adults of course, with regard to heritage speakers, we didn't have access to older speakers because simply uh, if you imagine that most of our heritage speakers uh, came as children to Germany in the 1990s or were born after the 1990s, so this simply makes an upper limit for, for the age span of heritage speakers here. So uh, the first and the third study also included age-matched monolingual control groups of uh, Polish participants living in Poland and who never left Poland. And the third study also included a group of late adult bilinguals, so representatives of the first generation of immigrants from Poland to Germany, so to say potential yeah, late Polish-German bilinguals who were around the age of 25 when they entered Germany. So they could not, of course, count as heritage speakers, but they were sort of the first generation that entered Germany. So um, if you look at the data that we gathered in these uh, studies, so the first study on these child bilingual heritage speakers, where we had a rather um, complex design with different groups. As I said, we had a Polish uh, monolingual control group um, in Poland. We had also German monolingual children, but I won't talk about German, so I will leave that group out. And then we had two groups as we, were investigated, as we were investigating age of onset effects, we studied simultaneous uh, bilingual heritage speakers and um, early sequential bilingual children. Um, and as you can see, the, the, age, the age range was quite large between five and 13 years old. So most of our children, were, however, were between eight and 11 years old. This is why the mean age is about uh, eight months and uh, eight years and seven months or eight years and six months or so eight and a half years, approximately. The methods we used, uh, we used different methods. We used an acceptability judgment task. We also used um, uh, experimental tasks where we elicited uh, um, oral speech, like a forced choice task, uh, a, a sentence repetition task. We also had an elicited picture story and narrative task. We used the famous main task for gathering um, oral narratives from our children. 
and also had a forced choice task where they had to decide between competing variants which they would prefer. Now we're going to talk about, in my talk, only about the data from the accessibility judgment task and uh, from the oral narratives that we um, gathered through this uh, main task, which is a picture story actually which they had to, to tell. Uh, the second study on the teenagers, uh, there were only two groups. We had, um, actually we had not been looking in this uh, project on age of onset attacks, so we just simply got the Polish heritage speakers. But for this talk, uh, of course, I divided them also according to their age of onset into two subgroups. So in, again, simultaneous bilinguals and early sequential bilinguals. And I took the data from the last wave of data collection when the children were between 15 and 17 years old. So they were older than the uh, children um, that we investigated in the first project. Uh, but you see the numbers are quite low because this was a longitudinal project. And we started, of course, with more participants. And we also had, of course, some dropouts. So this is why we ended up, uh, in the end, in the last year of data collection with about 15, 15 individuals. So it's not uh, a large group. Um, and as we had also Russian as a heritage language investigated in the project, uh, it simply was not feasible to gather more data uh, in this longitudinal design. We also used the sentence repetition task, but I'm not going to talk about that. We also used an illicit picture story narrative task. But given the fact that these children were older, we uh, did not use the main task, but we used uh, one of these famous uh, father and son picture story books um, with these comic strips uh, written by Erich Oser. Um, and we took out one of these picture stories in order to elicit also oral narratives. And we had used uh, a lot of other ta ta tasks as well, but I'm not going to talk about these uh, because we targeted their different kinds of proficiencies. So reading, um, uh, reading comprehension, reading, reading aloud, uh, oral comprehension. So we had tested several kinds of uh, uh, competencies from, from our children, but uh, today I'm going to focus only on the oral narratives from this group, actually. And the third group with the young adults, um, as I said, it was a four group design with, uh, again, heritage speakers, which I mm, post hoc now divided into these two groups of simultaneous bilinguals and early sequential bilinguals, uh, 19 and 11 um, individuals uh, in each group. Uh, um, then we had, uh, as I said, a group of Polish German late bilinguals and a control group of Polish monolinguals which were age matched to the heritage speakers. And we also used an accessibility judgment task. We also used an illicit narrative task. This time we also used a picture story from the father and son circle, but uh, the data will mainly come from another task where we um, asked our participants to describe how their ordinary day looks like. And we also had some grammatical tests like a closed test to gather data on grammatical proficiency. Okay, um, now um, for this talk, I'm going to look at two things. First of all, uh, I'm going to look uh, at whether um, there are some kind of developments that can be traced back to chronological age. So do these different age group of Polish heritage speakers that we were, we were investigating in these three projects, do they show different patterns with regard to the two properties that I'm going to focus on in this talk, or are they similar with regard to these properties? So is there some kind of development that we can be tracing back uh, in our data? And if there is some kind of a, a development, uh, what does this tell us, tell us about the de de developmental path of heritage Polish here in Germany? So with regard, of course, to these properties that we investigated, so are we uh, uh, evidencing uh, a, or are we observing a sort of a delay? So this is what uh, we would, uh, so what was our main hypothesis was regarding the literature that um, we just expected our heritage speakers to simply to be a bit delayed with regard to their acquisition of these features, but then they should reach also uh, a level that is comparable to monolinguals, simply takes them more time to gather experience from the input, or are we witnessing some kind of arrested development, which was uh, previously called also sometimes incomplete acquisition, which is not quite a felicitous term, so I simply will use the term arrested development. So does the uh, acquisition of these properties that we're going to look at um, sort of reach a certain point, but then does, don't go further? Or are we witnessing attrition? So can we see that the younger children acquire these properties, but then these properties are getting lost uh, in the older individuals? So this would be a clear, uh, would be a sort of a typical case for attrition to occur. 
And the second factor is related to uh, age of onset effects. So uh, we were addressing the question whether simultaneous bilingual heritage speakers differ from very sequential bilingual ones. And uh, also the question whether these differences are stable during the observed time span or whether they, we witness uh, a convergence towards um, the same patterns that are preferred or are we witnessing sort of diverging preferences with regard to these uh, features that we're going to look at. And uh, as we included for at least for the youngest and the oldest group also uh, acceptability judgment tasks for the uh, properties that we're going to look at. Um, are these differences also related to the type of data collected? So do they refer to the uh, judgment data or do they refer to the production data or to both or to none of them? Okay, now we're turning to the hard facts about Polish. Um, I'm just going to simply introduce um, the properties that we were looking at. The first property is word order in complex verb phrases in Polish. But first of all, Polish is often said to have a rather free word order, which is uh, however, not of the type that anything goes, but uh, we especially looked at the placement of the infinitive complement um, that uh, must occur uh, due to the use of uh, an auxiliary which has to be complemented by an infinitive. So this is what we find in German as well, but in German the pattern is different from Polish. This is why we decided to look at this feature, also to have some sort of an eye on potential cross-linguistic influence between German and Polish. So uh, in German, in uh, main clauses, we find, of course, the obvious uh, V2 rules of the auxiliary uh, or the modal verb, for instance, occupies uh, V2, whereas the infinitive or the participle complement normally occurs in the sentence final position, which is in German grammar is often called the famous uh, German sentence bracket. So in German, he has to wait for your call. You, had, you have the uh, modal, in, uh, modal verb uh, muss uh, in V2, and we have uh, the infinitive warten to wait uh, um, in a sentence final position. And all the other things are embedded within this sentence bracket. Whereas in Polish, you would normally expect in the unmarked word order that the infinitive complement immediately follows the auxiliary. So you normally expect in Polish on musi pocekać, not with telefon, which means that the modal verb is immediately followed by the infinitive pocekać in this case. But as I said, uh, that uh, Polish has a relatively free word order. Um, other word orders are not completely ungrammatical. So these discontinuous structures, which we find in German, uh, could be expected also uh, in Polish, uh, but they must be backed by some information structural requirements. Um, so uh, you can, of course, also say in Polish on Musina Twoj Telefon, Poczekać. But then uh, Poczekaj is focused and receives also some kind of an uh, additional stress. So um, this would be possible in Polish, but it would not be the normal unmarked word order in Polish. Uh, more natural do these um, discontinuous structures sound uh, if pronouns are involved. So if you have a pronoun and in Polish you have to uh, distinguish between the unmarked clitic forms of the personal pronouns, for instance, and the marked long forms, um, stressed pronoun uh, forms of the pronouns. So if you have these clitic forms, these unmarked short forms of the pronouns, they very often occur between the modal auxiliary and the infinitive complement. So in Pol Polish, it sounds quite normal to say, on musi mu orthodox książkę. Uh, again, the possibility is that uh, the clitic form um, uh, is uh, attached to other, for instance, to the infinitive is not excluded, so you can say in Polish as well, on musi otac mu książkę. This is also a grammatical way of saying that, but it would sound more natural uh, if uh, mu occurs after the auxiliary. So we have also uh, some sort of a language internal condition that we have to take into account. And this is what uh, the uh, sentence structure, the clause structure looks like. So if we encounter pronouns, especially clitic pronouns, we could also expect that these discontinuous uh, patterns do occur also in Polish. Um, whereas uh, in case that the uh, clause contains a full NPs, like not with telephon, we would expect rather that these full NPs occur after the infinity. So this is the main point that we're going to look at. Now let's uh, look at the first data. So here you see, uh, we start with the oral production data. So the elicited uh, narratives that we uh, investigated and then we just uh, sort of collected all the these kinds of complex web phrases uh, that met our criteria. Um, and uh, we simply just looked at whether we found uh, this adjacent positioning of modal auxiliary or auxiliaries in general and the infinitive complement or whether there is uh, a discontinuous structure. Uh, 
And on the left-hand side, you see the simultaneous bilingual heritage speakers uh, and the monolinguals. I hope you see my cursor. These are the monolingual data that we collected. Um, these are the different groups from the different projects. So we start with uh, the first three um, bars um, or pairs of bars are taken from the project on the uh, child bilinguals. Then we find uh, the uh, bar between 15 and 17. These are the uh, adolescents, the teenagers from our second project. And then we finally continue with the young adults, in this case, from the last, from the last project. And we, as we said, as I said, uh, we gathered also monolingual control data for the children and also for the adults. So we have adult controls, we have ch child controls, and we have these different types of age groups. Um, and here you see the simultaneous bilinguals, here you see the early sequential bilinguals, heritage speakers, and you just can, uh, now we're going to compare just the bars. These are the, is, is the relative frequency of these discontinuous structures um, or adjacent structures in these complex word phrases that we encountered in the oral narratives, irrespective of whether there was a pronoun or a full MP, just taken all examples together. Um, and to see um, quite uh, an interesting picture, I will first start with the monolinguals. First of all, you see that there is no statistical significant difference between the monolingual children and the monolingual adults. So uh, if we take, uh, if we have a look in general on these uh, complex verb phrases, you see that um, monolinguals clearly prefer the adjacent positioning of uh, the auxiliary plus the infinitive complement. This is what we expected, actually, that there is um, a higher degree of adjacent structures and only one third of these structures showed this discontinuous word order pattern. And uh, if you look now at the um, simultaneous bilinguals, you see that, um, that uh, this is not met by the younger bilinguals that we find. So the younger bilinguals, the two uh, youngest groups clearly prefer the um, discontinuous structure over the adjacent positioning, which clearly does not met um, the monolingual control group, so there is a, a, a significant difference between these younger ones and uh, the monolingual controls, uh, the child monolingual controls as well. But then you see this sort of U-curve shaped development. So then you see that uh, when they uh, started uh, starting their teenager years, sort of the number of um, discontinuous structures drops, heavily drops, uh, and uh, we find a dominant pattern um, of adjacent positioning of the infinitive complement to the um, modal auxiliary, which clearly maps also the uh, monolingual control groups. So they are getting more monolingual-like after they uh, enter the ages of 10 and more. So you have this sort of a, a transition point uh, when they started to, to be teenagers. Um, this is a highly significant difference between these two age groups. And uh, then it's, there's another turning point is when they start to enter the adulthood. Uh, adulthood. So uh, another significant difference. There you can see that the picture, that this uh, development towards monolingual patterns is sort of disrupted. And then we again find more instances of um, discontinuous structures uh, compared to adjacent structures. So we find this starting from a non very monolingual way to a even more monolingual way. And then we, they go back and show patterns that are not quite the same as uh, age natural monolinguals would show. And these are also statistically highly significant differences between this adult bilingual group and this monolingual control group. So if you look now uh, at the early sequential bilinguals, um, these are the same uh, monolingual data, of course. Um, um, and we now look, we see a, a bit of different picture. You see that for the youngest age group, the pattern is clearly monolingual-like. If we here see the group of the monolingual control group of the children, it's more or less exactly the same pattern. So they use more adjacent structures than discontinuous structures. So they're in line with the age-matched monolingual controls. But then here you find uh, sort of this transition point uh, a bit earlier than with the um, um, simultaneous bilinguals but going in another direction. So whereas the adolescent, the teenager, uh, simultaneous bilinguals show a more monolingual-like pattern here uh, in their teenager years. This is different for the early sequential bilingual ones. You see that here, there's some sort of a slight tendency to prefer the discontinuous structure, but overall there's not much development during the ages. So uh, this is clearly not a monolingual pattern and they differ substantially from the monolinguals, 
um, but there is no kind of a U curve shaped development as we found with the um, um, simultaneous bilinguals. Now, um, taking into account also the language internal factor, so we also distinguish between contexts where the clause contained a full NP and contexts where the clause contained pronouns, because we felt that we need to distinguish these two types of um, internal conditions, because as we saw the Polish differs with regard to preferences, uh, or we presume that Polish would differ from uh, the preferences uh, in these two, uh, with regard to these uh, two contexts. So when first now looking uh, at the fact when a full NP occurs in the clause, so where we would expect normally the uh, adjacent positioning to be um, more dominant than the uh, discontinuous structures, and this hypothesis is borne out by our monolingual control data. Again, you see that discontinuous structures almost play no significant role here uh, for the uh, monolingual controls. Again, there is no difference between the child monolinguals and the adult monolinguals. Also a clear preference for the adjacent structures. And you see that uh, here again for the uh, simultaneous bilinguals, you find a so-called uh, so a, a curve shaped development. So again, they start in a not very monolingual way. So the youngest age group uh, sort of slightly prefers the uh, discontinuous structures over the uh, adjacent structures. Then this changes a bit. So you see that the um, adjacent structures are gaining ground uh, already in the second age group. There is, however, no statistical significant difference between these two groups, but there is a statistical difference between the second and the third age groups. So again, when they enter um, the uh, teenage years, they sort of being like monolinguals again, so they clearly prefer the adjacent positioning over the uh, discontinuous structures. And then again, we found this second turnover point when they stand, started to be adults. So for the uh, young adult group, we again find that almost an equal distribution between um, uh, discontinuous structures and adjacent structures, uh, which clearly does not correspond to the monolingual age match control group. So again, you see this U-curve U -curve shaped um, development. And if we look at the uh, early sequential bilinguals, we find again another uh, a slightly different picture. Although, as you can see here, there's also a clear preference for the adjacent positioning, but the number of the um, discontinuous structures are significantly higher if compared to the control groups. So here, only the first group actually sort of, uh, again, the, the youngest group uh, clearly resembles the monolingual age match control group. Uh, but then uh, the children start to sort of prefer the uh, discontinuous structures to a much more considerably higher degree uh, than um, the monolingual controls. So again, in the same position you see with the adult bilinguals, we see also a slight preference for the discontinuous structures in this uh, case, which is a clear uh, sharp contrast to the monolingual controls who clearly prefer the adjacent positioning in these, in these instances. Now looking at um, the pronouns, so in case the clause contains a pronoun form, uh, I have to say that uh, these data have been treated, have to be treated with caution because um, uh, due to a very low uh, amount of tokens that uh, form the basis of this analysis. So they, these forms where a pronoun occurs simply are not so frequent in the data. So um, I would be very reluctant to draw any far reaching conclusions from the data on the pronominal, uh, on, the, on the clauses that have a pronominal direct or indirect object. Um, uh, but still, again, you see that here the situation is, is a bit different. You see that uh, for the uh, simultaneous bilinguals here already from the start, you find a distribution which is clearly um, more um, closer to the monolingual controls. And here we see that our, um, that our um, hypothesis regarding the, the fundamentally different nature of these clauses who contain a pronominal direct or indirect objects uh, were also borne out because in this cases, uh, the monolingual controls clearly prefer the discontinuous structure over the adjacent structure. And again, no statistically significant difference between the two um, monolingual control groups. Uh, and here you see that for the simultaneous bilinguals, you find a rather similar pattern for the youngest age groups. So uh, this is a contrast to uh, the other graphs that you, saw, that, that you just saw because here uh, it is already the youngest age group who behaves in a monolingual way. 
And then only in the adolescent years, uh, they start sort of to overgeneralize the adjacent position, which is the default position for the uh, structures who contain a full NP. They also try to uh, use this kind of structure when they um, are trying to, um, when they sort of uh, have uh, pronominal uh, objects and indirect objects as well. So they're sort of resorting to a default strategy where they use uh, the adjacent positioning in almost all cases, uh, which means that the number of um, discontinuous structure drops. But then again, in adulthood, it again rises and there are no significant differences between the adults, uh, the bilingual adults and the monolingual adults. And you see quite um, uh, uh, similar, but not an identical pattern for the early sequential bilinguals because they sort of clearly prefer the uh, discontinuous structures and only the adults start to use uh, also the adjacent structures in this position. But uh, this, uh, as I said, this is based on a, on a rather low number of tokens. So, um, and this even turned out that this is not a significant difference here between the adults and the uh, teenagers. So maybe we should be more cautious uh, in interpreting too much, but it seems to be the case that with these pronominal um, um, complements, uh, that uh, word order, um, that the acquisition of these word order patterns is sort of more equal in all three groups that we uh, observed. Okay, and as I said, and I'm sort of trying to, to catch up a bit, but um, I'm, I'm, there's not much left, so I hope I can finish in about 10 minutes. So we also gathered um, acceptance data from a grammaticality or acceptability judgment task. Um, um, so we presented uh, stimuli uh, with um, full NPs who showed discontinuous placement um, of auxiliary and infinitive complement. And we also showed examples of discontinuous structures that contained a pronominal uh, object or direct object. Uh, so we tested mainly the discontinuous structures, uh, whether they were accepted by our um, participants or not. And here you can see, uh, first of all, if you compare, uh, if first we look again at the monolingual data, that uh, for the monolingual data we find a preference for the um, adjacent structures in both contexts, so uh, with the MP, but also with the pronoun, uh, um, sorry, we found um, sort of a preference for the um, adjacent, uh, for the discontinuous structures, so they, they were accepted to a higher degree when they contained a pronominal object, a direct object. This is what we assumed at the beginning. So in this context, they would uh, clearly accept the discontinuous structures to a higher degree than in a context where a full NP is integrated into the clause, and this was borne out by, by our monolingual data. But still, um, even with uh, full NPs, uh, the um, discontinuous structures were accepted to a considerably high degree. So about 60% for the children and about 58% uh, for the adult um, monolingual controls. They tend to accept these discontinuous structures with, their, uh, with the NPs as well. And this sort of hints at the pragmatic flexibility of word order in these cases. So uh, simply you can imagine some sort of context where this um, where this discontinuous structure would sound more or less natural. Uh, so you can think about some, some focused uh, context where you have to focus on the infinitive. So as I said, uh, when I was presented the examples, this is an, a grammatical word order in Polish as well, but licensed, must be licensed by the information uh, structure. And so for this accessibility judgment task, they, our informants seemingly uh, sort of thought of context where this sort of strange discontinuous structure would be uh, still acceptable. So this is why they accepted them to a considerably high, high, high degree, but still with pronouns, they seem to be more acceptable than with uh, MPs. And if we look at um, the uh, bilinguals, you can just, if you just look at both um, um, types of bilingual speakers, see there are hardly any differences between the sequential bilingual ones and the uh, simultaneous bilingual ones. So with uh, in accepting the structures, they behaved quite the same. So uh, the smallest children, the youngest children uh, almost accepted everything. But this might also be linked to the fact that uh, acceptability judgment test is quite demanding for them. So um, also I would not place too many emphasis on, on, on these data for the youngest group. But still you can see that if compared to the monolingual controls, um, they accepted these uh, discontinuous structures uh, to a higher degree, at least uh, at least the adult uh, bilinguals. Um, this is a significant uh, difference between the adult bilinguals and the adult monolinguals. So the acceptance of these discontinuous structures with NPs uh, 
uh, is considerably higher than for monolinguals. But again, you see for the uh, simultaneous bilinguals, they are very skeptical in accepting these um, discontinuous structures, as we saw in the production data as well. So they are even over critical compared to the monolinguals in judging these discontinuous structures. And uh, it's pretty much the same uh, if we look at the uh, early sequential bilinguals, so interestingly. So there are not many differences between these two bilingual groups in this sense. Okay, shortly about my second uh, 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 property, this is null subjects. Now you might all know that German is a topic drop language, which means that it can drop subjects and objects, but only if they are occur in the topic position. So you can ask in German, was hast du mit dem Kuchen gemacht? What did you do with the cake? And then you can reach several answers. You can get several answers. You can say, habe ich gegessen with a, a dropped object. You can say, habe ihn gegessen with a dropped subject. Um, although this, of course, is more likely to occur in colloquial style, uh, but you can't drop the uh, you can't drop um, 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 the object um, if um, yeah if it's not in top position. For Polish uh, is the, the um, um, sort of situation is different. You Polish is a typical pro drop language actually, so you have um, subject omission, which is contact conditioned by subject verb agreement. And you can also drop the object, uh, which must be licensed by the topic position. So you can, uh, in German, the same, the same sentence in Polish as we had in German, would sound so, so is chaskiem, um, where you can see that there is a dropped subject uh, because of the uh, inflection on the verb, which indicates second person singular, so which indicates the subject. And you can uh, say as an answer, zjadwem, so with a dropped subject and with a dropped object. Um, so, um, Null subjects are the default in Polish, but of course, overt pronouns can be also required, for instance, in order to avoid ambiguities or in order to convey a special emphasis or uh, for focusing elements, you can also use overt pronouns. So this is not ungrammatical in Polish, but the default case would be that you drop the subject pronouns. And I will be concerned with subjects only. Uh, so uh, here we analyzed also, uh, not here we analyzed not yet not all data. So this is a rather small subsample that we analyzed here for the first study on child heritage speakers. These are only 10 simultaneous bilinguals and six early sequential bilinguals and 12 monolinguals. And we analyzed only the production data. For the bilingual teenagers, uh, we had also production data, uh, which were elicited not from a narrative task, but more from an interactive task. We used a map task for elicitating the data here. So where the teenagers, uh, um, sort of uh, were engaged in a conversation with their parents and they fulfilled this map task. I'm sure most of you will know what a map task is. And if not, ask me the discussion. I will shortly um, describe what this task was about. This is only 10 bilinguals analyzed here, six simultaneous and four other sequential bilinguals. And uh, the whole sample is only analyzed for our adults because it's a project that we finished rather uh, long ago. So this is why we coded all the data and analyzed all the data. And also, again, I will use the data from the elicited narratives and regarding the ratio of null and overt uh, subject pronouns. Now, these are the data from these uh, productive tasks. Um, um, here I grouped the, the, the groups a bit differently. You see, first of all, the three child groups, the child simultaneous child uh, heritage speakers, the simultaneous, uh, simultaneous child uh, bilingual heritage speakers, the sequential uh, heritage speakers, and the monolingual controls. And as you can see, um, no clear, no real, no, no, really no difference between these three groups. Actually, um, they used a rather high amount of full NP subjects, which might be related to the task. I, not, I do not know whether you're familiar with the main task, but there are a lot of uh, sort of heroes occurring, the small goats and the mama goat, and, and small bird, baby birds, and, uh, and cats, and foxes, and all these kinds of stuff. So it's not quite astonishing or not quite unusual that they use a lot of uh, full MPs as subjects in these narratives. Uh, but still, they use um, the null subjects to a considerably higher degree if compared to uh, pronoun subjects. So there are really no differences here. You see, with the teenager groups, uh, the, uh, but this is, is a different task. So this map task does not require to use uh, such a lot of full MP subjects if compared to the main task. So this is why full MP subjects um, here play only a minor role. But here they clearly prefer the null subjects, which is in line with uh, Polish grammar, so to say. And um, 
uh, when they reach adulthood, so from our adult bilinguals, we uh, also uh, gather data and you can see that uh, they clearly also use the, um, or clearly prefer um, the null subjects um, over pronominal subjects, but still if you compare the adult groups with one another, you can see that for this holds for both groups, so uh, the simultaneous adult bilinguals as well as the early sequential adult bilinguals differ significantly from the adult monolingual control group. And there's also a significant difference uh, between the two um, bilingual uh, groups. So here you can see between the simultaneous adults and the early sequential bilingual adults, there is also a significant difference regarding the distribution of null and uh, over the subject pronouns. Okay, now to conclude and to summarize the main findings. So if you look first of all at our first property, word order in complex verb phrases, um, is there any effect that we can maybe possibly attribute to chronological age? Well, with monolinguals, there's clearly no kind of development anymore. So we have a stable distribution of these word order patterns in the oral production data. Uh, but this really, or which type is preferred really depends on the internal structure of the clause. So they clearly prefer both um, monolingual groups, the young ones and the adult ones prefer the adjacent word order with uh, NPs and discontinuous structure with pronouns. And they also show um, a very stable acceptance rate. So there's no kind of a, a development uh, to be observed. So these patterns are already in place or the sort of the patterns are established already from the uh, child monolingual control group onwards. So uh, what is also quite interesting is that uh, they tend to accept these structures, discontinuous structures, especially to a higher degree than they would use it in oral discourse. So acceptance rates are higher than the ratios that we found in the oral production data. With the bilinguals, we see a, some, a kind of development. So there is a shift in the preference uh, for word order patterns between the child bilinguals and the teenage bilinguals and or between the teenage bilinguals and the adult heritage speakers, both in the oral production task and in the judgment data. Um, the shift is uh, more obvious with word order preferences for uh, complex word phrases that contain uh, full NPs uh, than for those containing a pronominal object. So uh, you remember I marked this transition points for the um, full MP sentences, we had almost two transition points, so where the preference has changed to a considerable degree or to a significant degree, whereas with the uh, pronoun data, although we have to treat that with some caution because there's not much data um, forming the basis of these studies, we have found only one transition point where the pattern changes, actually. Well, compared to our monolingual controls, these shifts in the preferences lead to either uh, more monolingual-like pattern of distribution, which means that simply the development is uh, a bit delayed, or it leads also to uh, or it leads to a divergence from the monolingual-like patterns, which we could interpret also as some kind of attrition, especially if the uh, default word order was acquired uh, in younger speakers. Um, but in the end, finally, if you look at the adult heritage speakers, then um, we can see that both um, Adult bilingual groups differ significantly from the monolingual controls, and this holds for the production data as well as for the judgment data. So uh, for both adult groups, we can see that there is a high preference for these discontinuous patterns in context with full MPs, which is not the monolingual-like way of treating these structures. Um, are there differences between simultaneous and early successive bilinguals? Um, yes, but they occur only in the production data, not in the judgment data. And when they enter adulthood, these differences also uh, in production data seem to disappear. So there are no differences anymore between uh, the adult sequential bilinguals and the adult simultaneous bilinguals. So as I said, these simultaneous bilinguals show this sort of a U-curve shaped development, um, uh, especially with regard to the context, uh, the context that contain a full NP. Uh, it is clear that the youngest and the oldest groups, so the young children and the uh, young adults, clearly differ from our monolingual controls, and only the teenage group sort of converge, converges towards the monolingual pattern and exhibits a strong preference for the adjacent uh, default word order. Uh, in context with pronominal uh, direct or indirect objects, um, there's also this U-curve-shaped U -curve development, but this uh, 
leads in the opposite direction because um, the teenagers differ significantly from the monolingual controls in this respect. So this is where they sort of trying to overgeneralize these uh, um, adjacent structures also to these uh, pronoun, pronominal contexts where we would expect uh, more instances of discontinuous structures. So they sort of um, resort more to a default um, adjacent structure positioning of um, the infinitive complements in these cases. With the early sequential bilinguals, uh, we see that only the youngest group uh, sh shows patterns that are uh, that pattern they pattern with monolinguals, and all other groups show a significantly higher preference for this discontinuous uh, word order patterns than uh, the monolinguals. And um, again, uh, in context with pronominal objects, these differences are not so pronounced. Uh, one could say that they keep uh, have a monolingual like pattern until they enter adulthood. And in adulthood, the uh, adjacent uh, non-monolingual-like or non-canonical adjacent pattern gain, gains ground. Um, but uh, as I said, uh, this might be also related to the fact that we don't have such a lot of data also for the, also the adult bilinguals were very reluctant to produce these sentences with pronouns um, because there's no statistical difference in this case between the uh, teenagers and the um, adults. So uh, might be a bit over interpreting this finding that uh, with adult uh, early sequential bilinguals, they use both structures to an equal degree. With regard to null subjects, we find um, an effect of chronological age in the sense that for all groups, we see that they develop uh, a higher preference for null uh, subjects. Um, in the course of their, or with increasing age, this applies to all of the groups, so to say. Um, and um, for the younger groups, this might be an artificial effect caused by our task, because this is why they use so many full MPs, you remember that. Uh, it might be more related to our tasks, so maybe this isn't even uh, such a um, very obvious development, but maybe it's sort of related only to the task that we use in this, uh, for the youngest speakers. And a significant uh, sort of um, increase in the use of uh, null subjects we find only with the simultaneous bilinguals over age. Are there differences between simultaneous and early sequential bilinguals? In this case, not in the groups of the children and of the teenagers, but only in the groups of the adult bilinguals where the differences really starts to get significant for the uh, adult groups. And uh, also both adult groups in this case differ significantly from the monolingual controls. So uh, they use, still use, although they also show a preference for null subjects, but they still use pronominal over subjects to a higher degree than the monolingual controls. So what does this mean actually for our research on age effects in monolingual and bilingual, uh, in, in bilingual language acquisition? Well, um, first of all, I would stress the fact that uh, language internal factors also matter. As we could see that both bilingual groups and the monolingual group controls show more or less the same developmental tendencies with regard to the complex web phrases which have a um, pronominal uh, direct or indirect object. Uh, but this um, is limited to these contexts, so in contexts where we have uh, full MPs uh, embedded in the clauses, uh, there are clear differences between these groups. But uh, still you have to take into account this uh, language internal condition as well. Well, the properties matter. As you see, I had two properties here for the present talk. Um, Regarding the acquisition of null subjects, we find more or less the same developmental paths for our bi and monolingual participants. Um, and uh, this differs for the complex web phrases. Interestingly enough, I would say these are both uh, these famous interface phenomena. So both uh, properties that we looked at are located at the syntax discourse interface. As I said, that information structure requirements um, also play an important role, whether to use or not use an open subject, or whether to use discontinuous or uh, adjacent patterns of word order in this um, context that we looked at. And we found also for our heritage bilinguals that the acquisitional setting, uh, the L2 age of onset, so the age of onset when they acquire German, the majority language does matter for our bilinguals, at least uh, with regard to the acquisition of word order in complex web phrases with full NPs. Because here uh, we found significant differences between the simultaneous bilingual heritage speakers and the early sequential bilingual speakers. Um, for the simultaneous bilingual speakers, we found that they acquire this default 
um, adjacent positioning of uh, the infinitive complement immediately following the auxiliary only with some kind of a delay, um, which might be related uh, to the split input they receive from birth, so that they have uh, input in German from birth. And German, of course, as we see, um, prefers clearly prefers these discontinuous patterns that also our youngest um, simultaneous bilingual um, informants show. Um, whereas for the early sequential bilinguals, it seems to be in place already from the onset uh, of their acquisition of the heritage languages. So when we started, um, also when they were already five years old. So here we did not find any uh, differences from the monolingual controls. So they seem to be to have acquired this adjacent default word order quite um, consistent, quite robustly. But on the other hand, um, although the simultaneous bilinguals sort of later converge towards the monolingual norm, if we compare it to the early sequential bilinguals, this sort of later convergence towards the um, sort of a Polish grammar seems to make their grammatical properties, at least uh, uh, with regard to the property that we were looking at, sort of also a bit more robust against uh, cross-linguistic influence if we treat these preferences for the discontinuous word order as sort of at least backed or motivated by the German sentence bracket position. Um, but we can also see that that they are sort of trying to oppose this cross linguistic influence also with regard to the um, treatment of the uh, adjacent and discontinuous word order patterns with the uh, pronominal um, um, objects and direct objects because here they also prefer the adjacent word order Although here, much more natural would be to use the discontinuous structure, but maybe this is a case what Tanya Kupisch has called cross-linguistic overcorrection. So they sort of trying to avoid this discontinuous structures because they know that this is the pattern that they exhibit in German. So maybe this sort of helps them to keep the two, um, the two uh, different uh, preferences apart, so to say. Um, so um, what we find then, um, is that, uh, as I said, the, the simultaneous spelling seem to be uh, a bit later in acquiring the monolingual-like pattern um, um, uh, with regard to um, um, with regard to uh, their uh, heritage language. Um, but uh, on the other hand, we could phrase it the other way. So um, the simultaneous spelling start to exhibit some kind of a cross-linguistic influence and a sort of overuse of the discontinuous word order pattern uh, rather late if we compare it to the early sequential bilinguals who show uh, this sort of convergence towards the pattern of the majority language German, so towards these discontinuous patterns uh, rather early. So it's starting already in the second uh, age group that we investigated. But when both groups enter adulthood, um, they both show the same convergence towards the German as discontinuous pre preference preference for discontinuous word order patterns. So um, we could say that for the simultaneous bilinguals, we have some sort of a U-curve development. So first of all, they overuse these uh, discontinuous patterns. Then they sort of acquire the monolingual default uh, adjacent word order pattern. And then they start again to use these discontinuous structures um, considerably more often than monolingual controls, which means that this would be sort of a combination between delay on the one hand side and attrition at later stages, whereas um, we encounter attrition with the early sequential bilinguals uh, much earlier uh, compared to the um, simultaneous bilinguals. Um, well, these um, sort of tendencies that upon entering adulthood, these differences between these two groups sort of disappear. This holds for both of the project uh, properties that we investigated. This holds for both the um, complex word phrases with full MPs and also with the null subjects, because as I said, also with regard to the null subjects, it's only the adult bilinguals that systematically differ and uh, um, significantly differ from the adult uh, monolingual controls. And uh, the last thing I want to point out is that we found the differences between these two bilingual groups, early and simultaneous bilingual groups, only with regard to the production data but not with regard to the judgment data. Okay, sorry for taking so much time. I'm very happy to take questions. And um, yeah, thank you for your patience and for your attention.